the picture of Petra came into full oh, view. I made nice. it into the background. You made it into. He went in looking for the Holy Grail. <laughs> oh, he's already got one. He's already got one. Are you sure? Oh yes, it's very nice. Can we see it? No. Oh, that's so funny. More Monty Python references. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Bearded Bible Brothers. I am one of the hosts, Matt Crosswhite, joined by Josiah Marshall. How are you, Snowbeard? <laughs> I'm doing okay. How are you doing, Firebeard? <laughs> I'm doing okay as well. Down here on the You're surface doing... of the sun called Tucson. I was going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but my family keeps razzing me. They're like, you you think this is hot? <laughs> so, Just Yeah, wait. I know it's only March. I know. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I remember when I used to work and live at South Rim of the Grand Canyon, and uh, there were some very hot days. And uh, mm. it would be fascinating to walk into the canyon and have a 20 degree difference than what it was on the surface. And so it Oof. was, it was definitely, oh, that was different. That was very different. <laughs> that was an experience to say right. the least. And it gave me a healthy respect for those who can live and tolerate the dry heat of Arizona. Yep. <laughs> we even sell in, in uh, different airports and stuff here in Arizona. We even, sell stickers and mugs and stuff that has a picture of a, a, a walking skeleton all clothed next to a cactus and it says it's a dry hate it's a dry hate <laughs> yeah oh yeah funny that's a funny <laughs> we just finished our 10 words or 10 commandments as they're more colloquially known yes. series right so yep. we're kind of in between Thanks things right heart. Now. That was good. I really was. enjoyed that. It was just good. And thank you for uh, we got we got a couple of emails from a nice lady in Oregon. She had some questions. Did we? I didn't up. see those. Oh darn it! I'm sorry. Um, yeah, we we did, <laughs> and it was just it was just wonderful to to have a reader writing in. Um, and, a listener uh, writing in. I mean, I'm sure yeah. she reads too. True. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get it right at some point. <laughs> but uh, it, it's always exciting to hear have a listener write in and give their perspective or ask questions and stuff like that. And um, uh, one of the things I pointed out was, well, I'm not wanting to just give you answers. It's it, this is what I've discovered in my research. I'm not here sitting on a position of authority to um, say one way or the other. But uh, this is what um, I've discovered with the subject. And it, it was a very positive conversation. And we, we very much appreciate the opportunity to have such positive conversations with our listeners, which is growing Absolutely. more and more. Um, our downloads are back up. Our listeners levels numbers are back up. It's, it's truly humbling to see just the, that, that, that we are being um, listened to and uh, considered for what we have to say. So, Value People for that, seem so to that's, that's a lot. seem to appreciate our our ramblings on and on about different topics, right? <laughs> so, so in in trying to uh, brainstorm about where we would go next, um, we were sharing what we'd been reading or or what um, books or authors we'd been enjoying recently, and so uh, the name Dr. Michael Heiser came up as it often does uh, in in my world anyway. Um, I love Dr. Heiser's work. And so, and Josiah mentioned that he was uh, reading, were you reading more Heiser or were you watching some of his YouTubes recently? I was watching some of his clips on YouTube. Okay. Um, I, I think it, it was a great, doing these has been a great introduction to him. I've also listened to his podcast, The Naked Bible. Um, and, uh, I've just appreciated overall his his 
approach, his biblical theology approach to the Bible. And, and I think that the title Naked Bible, I think, is very appropriate for his podcast because it's the Bible and nothing but the Bible. Yeah, sure. He mentions yeah. third, uh, you know, other resources, outside resources, but he focuses so much on what the Bible's saying and how the Bible's saying it and why the Bible's saying it, when, mm -hmm. how, so on. So I've I've really appreciated the guy, but you've had far more interaction with his stuff than I've had um, lately, and uh, I'm always interested to hear what, what your thoughts are on his stuff. So I don't remember if I brought up on the podcast or if it was just you and I in conversation. So I'll just revisit it quickly. Um, several of his books, um, one one of the ones I've enjoyed the most is. Um, reversing Hermon, like Mount Hermon. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, And yeah. the divine rebellion that happened there from uh, from the biblical text in Genesis 6 and then expounded on in the, the first book of Enoch. Um, and he dives into that and, and does an absolutely terrific, masterful job of it. Um, his more, his, his magnum opus work is called The Unseen Realm, and goes cover to cover through the Bible, talking about the the idea of God's divine court and mm. the the divine mm -hmm. court that serves him and is and surrounds him constantly. Um, it that that concept is not weird or foreign. It's all over the the scriptural text. But mm -hmm. we as Western evangelicalists. Uh, evangelicals have largely been taught to ignore it or to dismiss the supernatural nature of the Bible at large due to scientific method and, and our mm -hmm. reason and then deduction and all of that. So we are much more Greco Roman in our thinking than, than uh, Jude Judaic or biblically accurate. And so mm -hmm. he, uh, so the unseen realm just goes cover to cover through the Bible um, obviously not with, with a huge amount of, of depth, but, but it's no small volume either. Um, mm -hmm. talking about, here's another instance where, um, uh, it's very clearly referencing the divine council and that God is supreme over the divine council. He's the one true creator God, but the, the term used that gets translated in, in into English as God, whether capitalized or lowercase is the, the Hebrew word Elohim, and all that means right. is spiritual beings. That doesn't right. mean the one true. That could mean um, Baal or Asherah or, um, or Molech or any of the others. Marduk. Mm -hmm. um, those are all gods. Those are all Elohim. They are all created beings, created by the one true God, Yahweh. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and some there are many Elohim in God's council in His uh, in His divine court that still are not in rebellion to Him and still serve Him. There are some mm -hmm. that uh, rebelled uh, with with the first rebellion of Genesis three, uh, that the first rebellion that led to Genesis three, then the second rebellion of Genesis six, and then the third in Genesis eleven with the Tower of Babel. Um, if anybody wants to hear more about those three in, in depth and detail, I just listened to a really cool podcast. Um, the group, it, it, the, the podcast is called blurry creatures and neat guys. They do, they invite a lot of different people on their show with a lot of different perspectives. They don't wholeheartedly endorse or believe or agree with everybody that comes on their show, but it kind of gives everybody a platform. Um, but episode 225, they had Dr. Joel um, on the show. They just call him Joel. So I'm not, I'm not going to pronounce his last name right. But Dr. Joel <laughs> Mudamal, M Mudamali, I don't know. Um, but the guy uh, actually studied under Heiser and had Heiser mm -hmm. as, as part of his, as one of his professors. Uh, and he very, very brilliantly in this podcast, very, um, simplistically not he, he takes a complicated topic and makes it makes it very uh, simple for the average listener to go through what are those three rebellions and when you when you mm. talk about 
rebellions against God. All evangelicals know about Genesis 3, but what are those other two that Matt just listed? Well, episode 225 of Blurry Creatures explains it really, really well. But um, I love Dr. Heiser um, when I taught back before we made the move to Tucson. Um, some, some dear, dear friends of mine and I went through a 48-week session uh, through the book of Revelation, largely mm -hmm. doing my own study, but also supplemented significantly by Heiser and his, uh, his walk through Revelation through the Naked Bible podcast, and pretty well tracked along and agreed with most of his stuff right up until he got to the millennium. And then, mm -hmm. uh, to be perfectly honest, I don't know where he got some of the ideas he, may, he, he had, um, but, and I, I just couldn't get on board with some of those ideas, but but his overall mm. approach to, to the revelation and chapters one through 19 of his study were, were super beneficial to me building, building our study, mm. um, which I've alluded to in previous episodes that I'm going to be taking right. notes of that and putting it in a book at some point. But, but yeah, mm -hmm. that's kind of my exposure to, him. I have three or four or five of his other books that I have not yet read. They're on the to read list. Um, <laughs> I have his book on angels, on demons, um, two different books. Um, uh, I don't remember what other ones of his I've bought, but not yet read. <laughs> but he, what have you been finding yeah. of him on YouTube? Well, it, it's it's interesting. I, I like the little tidbits he offers, and um, one of the things I've I, I think I've greatly appreciated more is his simple answer to questions and it's this is where i've read it from this is what i've understood it to be um and i was thinking about this just the other day uh i can't remember who i was talking to but um i uh in the past uh, having worked as in churches and as a pastor in some in various positions um, have run into many uh, an attendee member Christian saying, "Hey, I've got questions about reading the Bible," and it's always sad in me to hear them being told by others, "Go read your Bible," and it's it, it's counter counterproductive, counterintuitive, and I just I just don't understand. But then at the same time, I can appreciate even where I would be. If I wasn't able to answer a question and I felt uh, embarrassed that I didn't know the answer, I, I, you know, I could see how I could at least possibly tell somebody, well, just go read your Bible. But I've always enjoyed being able to sit down with people and, and, not, and as I said, not providing answers, but just looking at the Bible together and asking questions and, and talking it over. And so just the, just the fact that he's not only um, – answering questions but that he's doing it through a dialogue with his uh, listeners and his watchers i've seen a Absolutely. number of his videos already where they'll post hey this is a question from somebody and he'll start answering it and going mm -hmm. into what he's found and i again i like his approach on biblical as, as as far as a biblical theological approach because i think systematic theology has been overused and Absolutely. it has created it has created a number of problems on a cultural level, doctrinal level. It's, it's truly even a social level, even a social level. Um, and most of those problems I, seem to be going unaddressed. I agree. And so here's Michael making an effort at least to try to open that dialogue. And that's yes. what I've really appreciated about him, even though yes, he's passed away. But the organization he started is continuing on, which I think is fantastic because Absolutely. how many churches, how many organizations have we seen um, close their doors or stop the, the spearhead, um, the person mm. at the top, the person who put it all together, passed away or moved on? Yeah. It, it was obvious that Naked Bible was never about Michael Heiser. And Michael, even though he was the chief voice on there. And what was really Agreed. cool for me personally, I only discovered him and his work probably six months before he passed. Um, oh, really? Okay. 
And then after he passed away on the Naked Bible podcast, um, the next couple of episodes, because um, they the host would touch base with him at the beginning of each episode. Hey, Mike, how you feeling today? And he explains it was it was a chemo week, so I'm struggling this week, mm-hmm. or I'm, it it wasn't mm-hmm. a chemo week, so I got to go on a wife, walk with my wife and stuff like that. Very good, yeah. uh, very personal uh, of him to share those things. And then after he passed, um, the show had several, several people on, um, other, other brilliant biblical scholars. Um, the, the first one on there, and, and another one of my all-time favorites is Dr. Tim Mackey. Um, and he got on and talked about um, how much of his work kind of uh, uh, bumped elbows, so to say, with Heiser. And sometimes they would do some projects together and how much he appreciated and respected Heiser and stuff. And then they had several others do the same thing. And all the while, the host is telling the, the listening audience, please write in or, or do a, a brief um, audio, send us an audio file of, of thoughts and uh, memories of, of how Dr. Heiser's teachings have impacted you. And I think they had to do like three hour and a half episodes because so many people responded with how they had been impacted and touched by Heiser's teachings. And, and um, it, was, it was really cool to get to hear the legacy of a man that I had only really just discovered and, mm-hmm. and to get to hear that, uh, that they were going to continue on with the studies and, and the ministry. And I know that Tim Mackey helped them finish up the, the s- series that they were currently going through, which was, I don't remember if it was first or second Samuel. Um, mm-hmm. but he kind of jumped in and, and did the study there. And, and I know they're on to other projects now and, I'm just like you say. I'm I'm really glad that it didn't shut down as he, as he was mm-hmm. called home. Mm-hmm. I agree. I one of the things that I'll also point out that I've appreciated is that he provides, in common language, in easy to understand terms, concepts that would normally only be available to say somebody in seminary, and that's yes. one thing I've appreciated about YouTube. Honestly. Um, I, everybody, and I included, have various opinions on social media in general, but YouTube sure. has provided a specific platform for um, the average individual to learn about topics that would otherwise be limited to uh, people paying for a, a, a certain level of education. And mm-hmm. um, he has he has brought it into simple terms, practical uh, practi- practical uses, and um, that's oh man, I've I've really appreciated that about the videos I've come across, such as um, some of the recent ones I've watched. Uh, was uh, one was uh, why don't pa- why don't why pastors don't talk about the things Doctor Heiser talks about, and <laughs> it's it's funny because what what Heiser actually points out is something I remember he- learning. Let's see. I heard this back in, I think that was Liberty university when I was attending there. And that was, it takes years for everything that the pastor has learned to be digested through to the congregation that he is working for. And, um, sure. It, and while that can be the case, I'm wondering it's made me wonder over the years and watching that video reminded, reminded me of this. It's made me wonder then why are we doing the sermons we're doing in churches these days? Um, I'm reminded of, of us. I think I mentioned this in a previous podcast. We went to a church here recently and the entire sermon was on grief. And the pastor only said, I'm only going to get theological twice, but everything else is just about grief. And so, um, I appreciate the position that the pulpit can offer on a Sunday morning to address a a single topic for a specific reason. But sometimes I think that that specific topic isn't always conducive or, or expected in such a setting and doesn't provide uh, answers 
for the people coming there for a specific need. And that is, we want to know more about God and we want to know more about the Bible. Right. And, and why not do that exact same series from the Bible? Ours exactly. is the only holy book where one of the 66 books is actually named Lamentation. Yes. Why, why not do a series on grief from scripture? That's absurd not to, to, to ignore that. And two thirds of the Psalms are David or, or the psalmist, other psalmists r- crying out to God. And why not educate right? your people from scripture on what it is to lament, to grieve, to cry out to God? Teach them, does God care? Can God hear you? Why does it sometimes mm-hmm. feel like your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling? Where is God yeah. in the midst of your grief? Why did he allow this to happen? Why not teach them that from scripture? Ah, yes. Sorry, you got me all oh. worked up, Josiah. <laughs> well, actually, I blame I, you. I would, well, blame me because um, one of the other areas that I recently saw Michael touch on with one of his previous videos was um, spiritual warfare and mm. what it is. And one of the points he made was, we shouldn't think it's so casual and easy that we should engage with the spirit world in, in warfare. Nowhere in the Bible mm. does Jesus say, go out there and kill demons. Right. And he makes the point of what's going to scare the demons most is when the commission, what scares the demons most is, is the God, it's Jesus's commission coming to fruition. That's what scares mm-hmm. them. And it's not that Jesus is saying, no, don't have interaction with demons. But when you do have come across one, know how to handle it and know that Jesus has given us the authority to handle it. But that's absolutely the idea that I've even seen in church culture to actively go out and say, we're going to have war with the devil today. And it's like, why? What what purpose is that going to serve you? What purpose is that going to serve others? Um, when Jesus has already done that for us, and He's already done that for us, given us we a are mission to, to do, we are called yeah, to be are, His disciples. And yeah, sorry, go ahead. We're called to be His ambassadors. Yes, we are not so, uh, called to be His generals. Nope. That is intentional. Mm. The Bible, Re- like Romans, how, called yeah, us, that was perfect. That was perfect. Says I like we, how you phrase that. <laughs> We are more than conquerors through Christ. Why, why, why more than conquerors? What does that mean? It means we already had a conqueror who came mm-hmm. and made conquest on our behalf. Mm-hmm. Yep. And now we get to reap the benefits of being adopted into his family. And I'm not, and, and neither Josiah or I are saying that spiritual warfare is un, unreal or untrue or oh, no, anything like that. But, But we very much need to rethink it because way too many churches, and from my experience, personal experience only, it's the charismatic and Pentecostal congregations that tend to overdo it um, more often than the other denominations. But anybody's Mm -hmm. uh, open for the the possibility of it. But it's almost (laughs) like in it. It almost becomes like an impassing. you know, I had this negative thought, so I said, get behind me, Satan. Like, okay, fine. Yeah. When Jesus said that, who was he addressing? Why was he addressing it? What did he follow it up with? What was the context? And mm-hmm. and, and I, I agree with what you said, My, Heiser said, that the demons are, are most scared and most threatened by the commission coming to fruition. I really like that phrasing. Because Mm -hmm. it's only when we stand on our identity of who we are and whose we are that it makes any difference in the spiritual world. We can shout at the heavens till we're blue in the face. That that makes no difference. Honestly, we we really run the risk of becoming like the sons of Sceva who tried to, to cast out a demon in the name of the God whom Paul... I don't remember if it was right. Paul or Peter, wh- whom Paul is uh, teaching, and the uh-huh. demon possessed guy, the demon in the guy, s- looks at him and and says, uh, "No, the Jesus whom Paul is portraying, I think, is how it says." And uh, I don't have it open in front of me, but the demon looks at him and says, "Jesus, I know Paul, I've heard of, but who do you think you are?" 
and he gives them the whooping of a lifetime. And and honestly, the I, personally, I don't think the devil gives us a whooping of a lifetime when we flippantly engage in what we think is spiritual warfare, because that mm -hmm. would show his hand too much. He would rather us just stay ignorant. And sure, shout at the heavens, fine. That doesn't affect him at all. Why would he interrupt you? If, if you think you're doing something good mm -hmm. and you're doing something pointless, he's going to let you do that pointless thing. Right. Right. But ambassadorship is a lot harder. Because to be a general, I, I have to be a military commander. I have to be aware of my people, my troops, and be familiar with the enemy and his uh, modus operandi and how he tends to do things. But a lot of it is pure strategy. To be an ambassador, mm -hmm. I have to do a lot of self-work. And sometimes mm -hmm. it can be a lonely, private, quiet work. Just mm -hmm. me and my phone with headquarters, my, my red phone on my desk, my conversations yeah. with the Holy Spirit. I have to yeah. be a whole lot more introspective and checking myself to see, is there any fruit hanging on my tree? Any fruit mm -hmm. worth emulating? Am, I'm mm -hmm. an ambassador for a country. Am I representing it well? Am I making it attractive? Not in, am I trying to sell it? But am I, am I doing a quality job of representing the fruit of the Spirit? And right. humility. And yeah. uh, humble graciousness. And turning the other cheek. And loving my neighbor as myself. That yeah. it's a it's a harder personal work, which I think is part of the reason why, even though that is the biblical work, and I, I think that's why it's the more neglected of the two. It's easier to I learn how agree. to shout at the heavens. I would definitely agree. I've really appreciated how you've been phrasing all this because it it definitely reflects a position a perspective and an attitude that's more in keeping with a disciple of Jesus rather than some sort of rabbinic leader or even just group leader. Sure. It goes back to that yeah. Matthew 10 or was that Matthew 10 or 23 where, where Jesus is talking about, um, I am the rabbi and the entire argument that the disciples were having about, oh, no, who's who's number one? Mm. And then granted, while that was a standard practice among rabbinic schools, that the number one disciple was then able to take the authority of the rabbi from his rabbi and then go and become his own rabbi and open his own school. Here's Jesus right. saying, I'm the school's not closing. <laughs> the school's not closing. <laughs> I'm, I'm still the I'm still the teacher here. And it, if yeah. you don't mind, I'm actually going to mention something that um, I was. I've been reading uh, the Leviticus Parsha book that Rabbi David Foreman published mm -hmm. just recently. It just recently came out, came, came out, came, came Don out, down, came out. In the end of the and um, one of the, one of the uh, last things he actually discusses in the book is this, um idea of eden coming back as far as there's there's i and then there's we and it and he really does a phenomenal job i think of bringing us into an understanding of what it means to be a member of god's household granted he may not be referencing the the brit hadashah or the new, the te new testament second testament whatever you want to call it um He's not referencing it, but it definitely brings into perspective, even from the very beginning of Genesis, of what God's trying to establish, why God's wanting to establish it, and his whole expectation of it. It goes back to one of the pre well, this was a while ago since we talked about this, but that same statement of where God says, where are you? You're not where mm. I expected you to be. And the same statement was made by, uh, I think it was uh, Isaac to Abraham with the whole incident of going up um, to Mount Harmon mm. to do the sacrifice. 
this isn't where it's expected to be. Where where are you? And so um, you're not where you're you're supposed to expect it to be. And so, anyways, um, this this whole idea of an ambassadorship ends up becoming, I think, a a very core demonstration that I see with Michael Heiser and the group he worked with. It's not about Michael. Right. This is about the Bible. This is about yes. Jesus. This is about God and how each of us are being representatives of a household of a people that is being mm -hmm. called to a specific goal and purpose. Fear God and keep his commandments and as a result, be a blessing to those around you. Mm -hmm. And by being that blessing, we get to demonstrate and communicate this great commission. I And so I, I've really appreciated the attitude, the humility, as you said earlier, um, the meekness even of yeah. the approach that Michael and his group have gone through. And I've started the podcast and uh, I've, I've kind of I haven't gone literally as much as I've found some things and picked through. And it's, this it's really good stuff, because mm -hmm. how often is it that you even get to sit in church and have them go through one book of the Bible in detail and answering very specific questions, especially within the original context? That's one thing I really wanted to point yes. out was that. Michael really focuses on original historical context and content. Whereas Which is so, a lot of so what, important. Yes, Sorry, I couldn't agree more. I don't mean to cut especially. You off. No, you're fine, but I I please cut me off if you want because the <laughs> the anachronistic um practices that we have these days diminishes and gets so much and prevents us from being able to truly understand the intertextual and intercontextual yes. um, narratives and components of scripture in some very powerful and by ways. Taking, and by taking that approach to our, our sermon series or, or whatever, um, by only ever staying topical, it also accidentally communicates to any given congregation that yeah. if reading it in in, chronolo in chronological order, it just as it is, is too difficult for Joe Congregant. And so it almost implies, don't try. And then the churches that do end up doing, um, uh, what's it called, where you, you teach through a book of the Bible? Uh, starts with oh. an E. Expository. Yeah, it does. Ex yep, there it is. <laughs> I almost wanted to say so, exhaustive, but no, that's not it. Expository. Yep, that's it. Exposition. The, the churches that do do exp expository teaching, uh, one of the mm -hmm. biggest uh, chain ones, for lack of a better word, uh, right. would be like Calvary Chapels. But mm -hmm. even then, you only get their perspective on it. You get a right. modern, individualistic, Americanized, yep. Culturally oh, appropriate yes. to today, oh, almost yes. completely divorced of Jewish context, almost completely yep. divorced of historical context, besides maybe some references to Josephus, almost no reference to the Dead Sea Scrolls, almost no reference to, absolutely no reference to any of the other uh, first century Jewish apocalyptic texts like Enoch or Baruch mm -hmm. or, or Fourth Ezra or, or any of those. It, just mm -hmm. so much of it is so extremely left out that it, it's like they're only ever reading commentaries written by Westerners from the 1800s forward rather right. than going and studying the actual source material. So that's why Heiser, right. and actually I've learned through the Blurry Creatures podcast and through a couple of other sources, there are people who Heiser seems to have like lit the fuse and did and, and laid a terrific foundation on on this style of teaching and and mm. re reteaching the supernatural nature of the bible and the super mm -hmm. supernatural elements therein but many people it seems have taken up that mantle and carried it forward in various different respects yeah. uh, one of them is that is dr joel who was on uh, blurry mm -hmm. creatures 
there was another gentleman um i'll have to get his name but um the uh heiser himself interviewed him on the naked bible podcast and they were talking mm -hmm. about paul's paul in the epistles his misuse of mm -hmm. the old testament and why paul would mm -hmm. intentionally misquote the old testament and and not a single one was accidental not a single one was flippant and not a single one misused the content of the old testament he might have changed a couple of words but he did so very intentionally it would be like me dropping a movie quote with you and changing a word so that it hits you slightly different you you mm -hmm. see it you recognize wh what i did and then it mm -hmm. leaves you wondering why did i change the wording of that because mm. jesus did so, it too oh oh yeah oh yeah so here's the, a really uh, cheesy example go ahead uh, uh, Oh, so here's a really cheesy example for for our listeners. Okay, you ready? I'm almost embarrassed yeah. to do this, but but <laughs> <laughs> it, it'll help make the point. Is it another okay. Monty Python reference? No, unfortunately, not that one. Okay. Um, but I'm I'm gonna use a. Okay, I'm just gonna do it. Here you go. Ready? Oh gosh. Okay, here we go. <laughs> show me the toilet paper <laughs> right the original quote is show me the money but i i changed the quote i know i know pull yourself together josiah i intentionally changed the quote i intentionally misquote it but i did it on purpose right. and I, partly just to make you laugh but also partly because i'm trying to make a point maybe about <laughs> the how how uh, i mean out of context that could make several different points it could be talking about current inflation and how much toilet paper is almost sure. how, how how undervalued the american dollar is right now could also be a <laughs> reference to 2020 when toilet paper was super expensive like certain things uh -huh. could be deduced from that but it was all done with intentionality and so heiser yeah. interviews this this gentleman who's who had just finished his PhD dissertation, I believe, and then was writing a book, basically taking his PhD dissertation and, and simplifying it for broader, broader audience, um, who mm. his whole study was when Paul does that, why Paul does that, and how mm -hmm. uh, in Paul's doing of that, he never did it disrespectfully of the text, never removed it from the original context and the original idea of the original author, but he tweaked it to make the point that it, and the point he always made was in agreement with the original author, but yes, mm. he misquotes it. And certain, um, certain naysayers to the Bible will say um, that the person who authored two thirds of the new Testament couldn't even quote the old Testament correctly. How, how can we trust any mm -hmm. of this? And they assume mm. that he did it accidentally and that he didn't have a familiarity with the old old testament um it, oh, mm -hmm. I, I, it, a whole bunch of absurd uh assumptions are being made with that argument right. but right. It, it's one of those things where we're, we're not here to out argue people but when yeah. you dig into some of the arguments that they make mm -hmm. and it, mm -hmm. it, it makes you dig deeper and you go okay why why did paul do that first of all did he do that mm -hmm. and then you find out yes he did okay why did he do that one of the common answers is well he was just quoting the septuagint and the septuagint uses different wording well yes and no mm -hmm. sometimes he it quoted is a translation septuagint. yeah yes but also sometimes he changed it and the septuagint is not the answer to that why mm -hmm. did he do that and mm -hmm. and when you dig in it just it's another opportunity to to show the brilliance, the absolute brilliance of Scripture. The, mm. the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. used everybody from um, from a nomadic murderer on the run from Egypt to uh, to Saul of Tarsus, who we know as yeah. Paul, who was a student of Gamaliel. He was on his way to to sitting in the highest 
court, the highest judiciary of Israel in, at the time. He he used mm. the princes and the poplar poppers, as it were, as it is. So, <laughs> and the Bible says, yep. and and that that very knowledgeable person, Paul, said he that God, he God, uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and it's super fun to study this stuff and to dig in and. To just for me personally, to use it as worship. Wow, Lord, yeah. I didn't realize that you. I knew you were detail oriented, and, right. and I just found another op, another place where you were so detail oriented that you even did this. Wow, yeah. that's super cool. Yeah, thank you yep. for being so much more yep. amazing than even I I realized yesterday. Mm-hmm. Indeed. Which is why I would say there are three other areas that I really appreciate Michael Heiser and what he's doing. One is he helps us remember that even though we have a completed book in front of us, that this book spans 1500 years and it's cre- and it's a, and it's coming together. And that mm-hmm. in those 1500 years, languages transition, culture transitions, and that he highlights the different, okay, there's first, there's first temple um, language. There's second temple language. There's second temple doc- documents. There's first temple documents. There's there's different ways of of how things are being perceived throughout 1,500 years of time because it's established. Language is going to change. Culture is going to change. Perspective is going to change in that course of time. He also, yeah. without saying it, is showing a post supersessionistic approach and in, an understanding of scripture. Yes. Because he, I, I don't, and and you could correct me if I'm wrong, but I have yet to truly hear him say, um, "I do not believe in supersessionism," and this is I'm going to make a deliberate attempt to look at scripture post supersessionistically, um, where the Christian Church has replaced Israel and all of the triumphant language and jargon and the supersessionist thinking along with the replacement theological rhetoric that ends up replacing everything that we're reading in scripture to what we have today. It's like, uh, it doesn't make sense, but he's doing this in a way without being so obvious. He's not trying Mm. to at least make a point of this. He's just simply stating things as they are. And that's another thing I appreciate as well as him taking material extra biblical documentation and uh, approaches and perspectives of scripture and showing us you don't have to be afraid of these just because you're not familiar with them doesn't need you you need to be afraid of them and that's one thing i've not only appreciated about him but there's even some others that have done that but still for the average believer who has been in sort of their own bubble, but really in then just their everyday practice of things and not really getting influenced by things outside of that, they're being able to hear him and listen and w- watch and read what he has put out and be able to realize I it may be different. It may be new to me, but mm-hmm. I don't have to be afraid of it. And it's not out there to contradict God, it may contradict what I believe, which mm. could could always use a little bit of stirring, right? But it's not going to contradict Bible, and it's not going to contradict mm-hmm. what God, who he is, and what he's done, and what he's continuing to do. Yes, but w- with that, there are texts out there from antiquity that are meant to contradict the Bible. Correct. We do need to Correct. be aware. Like, I completely the agree. Gospel of I, I've not read the Gospel of Thomas, but I've heard oh that it's not super accurate. Um, but I, I agree. like the, the the most obvious one is the Gospel according to Judas Iscariot. Oh, obvious yes. heresy, yes. obvious yes. absurdity. So there are texts out mm-hmm. there from Correct. those don't even date all the way back to antiquity because they were written much much later. But uh, but we can we can have a level of discernment without fear. If I read mm-hmm. this, and it's pretty obviously going against what the rest of Scripture says, that doesn't exactly. mean it's some new secret knowledge that's only just being mm-hmm. revealed. It means it's heresy. Throw it away. Mm-hmm. But there's also a ton of extra biblical texts, meaning texts that were not included in the canon of Scripture for one reason or another, mostly, uh, most simply because 
they probably don't help you get to know who God is personally and his cosmic rescue plan. Um, but mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that they're not amazing, accurate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. texts that help understand yeah. um that, that help you understand the biblical text. One of the one of the biggest ones that I really appreciate that Heiser has has brought up, um, what is his explanation on First Enoch, and how he talks about no, you're right. First Enoch is in, is not in the Christian Bible except for the uh, Ethiopian Bible, but mm -hmm. it seems the the Ethiopian Ethiopian Bible was a lot less. Uh, strict on what books they allowed in and what what they didn't. Our right. Bible has sixty six books. I think theirs has eighty eight. Um, yeah, but the Book of Enoch, you should read it because the biblical authors, the New Testament mm -hmm. authors, assume that you have read it, and so yep. they make quick passing reference to it, and they assume yep. that you're picking up the references that they're laying down. Right, the places because they weren't like first. They weren't anticipating the fact that they were writing scripture. They were just writing in their given time frame within their given culture, given the material that was out there. Sure, I think they might have had some awareness that they were writing scripture because Peter specifically notes that Paul's writings are difficult, just like the rest of scripture is, and so he he's in essence calling mm. Paul's writings scripture, but. And so I think they had some. That's interesting. I think they had some level of awareness to that, but uh, Peter and and Jude both directly directly referenced First Enoch. Paul alludes to right. it frequently, but yeah. if you've never read First Enoch, and and for any anybody who's listening to this, going, I need to get a copy of First Enoch. Um, <laughs> get a copy of First Enoch. <laughs> Second and third, yeah. I can't speak to because I've not read them yet. But from my understanding, they were written much later and they get weirder and weirder as they go. But um, but the biblical authors very clearly read, were familiar with, took seriously and and uh, treated as valuable the book of First Enoch. I will warn yes, you, sir. it is weird. But <laughs> so is the revelation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so were so were a lot okay. of the things that God told Ezekiel to do. I mean, have you read Zechariah recently? It's weird. Oh boy. Oh boy. Some of some of this is weird. But that doesn't mean it's not helpful and accurate and true and good and edifying. So that's all I'll say about that. That's my disclaimer. Everybody should go read First Enoch, but just be in a seated position when you do. I agree. And, I, and I'll, I'll reiterate what you said earlier. There are things out there that are deliberately written to undermine Scripture and God's yeah. and, and who God is. Um, there's even some Christian, uh, there's even fantasy books out there that have been done that deliberately, not Christian mm. fantasy, just fantasy in general. Um, sure. I'm not going to name names at the moment, but for, for the sake of this, um, while, yeah, I would reiterate, while those sources, such as the Gospel of Judas Iscariot, the Gospel of Thomas, and others, have been designed to com create confusion and to pretty much say, no, that's that's worthless, this is what the truth is, um, we don't have to be afraid of it, but we can look at it and know for a fact that, yes, this is contrary to what God has said and what God has done through his word. And we can also be able to differentiate what his word is and what his word isn't. Amen. A decent barometer that way. And so um, I've, I've really appreciated this conversation because I, I think that there are sources out there that I think would, is, is so beneficial to the average pers person, but then there's so many and trying mm. to, trying to kind of go shopping among them can be, feel like you're going into the largest Walmart in the world and going, where is this? Where's that? How do I, what's yeah. going to, how am I going to find what I need? But hopefully some, uh, some of our listeners will have taken away that this has been a source of incredible encouragement uh, that's encouraged questions and that's encouraged 
reading the Bible for what it says. And so I really appreciate Michael Heiser. I really appreciate the Naked Bible podcast. I have not listened to Blurry Creatures, so I'm going to definitely tune into that. But um, um, just keep really, in mind with Blurry Creatures, they have some odd ones, and they do, the hosts do not agree with and and uh, believe everything that any guest on their show espouses. That's all I'll say. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, we really appreciate you tuning in today for Bearded Bible Brothers. I thank so much for Firebeard and him being able to talk about this and share his passion for, for this source. And um, we look forward to hearing from you. Please, please send us some other sources, some podcasts, some authors, some books that you have found to be encouraging and helpful for you to understand scripture. So until yes, next time, if, if, oh, if you haven't ahead. noticed, we are nerds and we love connecting with <laughs> other nerds. And and other yes. authors to yes. to asp- to continue our our nerd library. So please write to us. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. You you didn't help me the other day. You told me about a new uh, an, an author I had not heard of, and I went and found the book you mentioned, as well as one other book you wrote, and they're already in the mail. <laughs> so- nice. I apologize, Heather. Sorry, but not sorry. They're great books. We'll have to talk about those on a different episode. Okay, let's close this one out. After I interrupted your outro, let's close this one out. We love you all. Thank you for listening. Tune in next time. Bye-bye.